What up, Dodgers Nation? DMAG here. And today we've got a collaboration. It's a Dodgers Nation Hogwatch collab today. And I'm joined by my man. He represents the San Diego Padres. You know his channel. You can follow him at the Hogwatch. My man, Borna. Thanks for rocking with us today, Borna. Yeah, man. Everyone, welcome to the show, DMAC. Good to finally do a show with you. Padres, Dodgers, round number two. Lots to discuss from round number one. Lots to discuss from both of these teams' seasons so far. But, man, it's, uh, it's good to be here, man. Yeah, no, and it's going to be a long season. You're going to have some fiery matchups. You already had some fireworks in the first series, and this team is already going to link up for a second time, and they won't face each other again until August 4th through the 7th. So a very pivotal season coming up, a series coming up. This time it's going to be at Chavez Ravine, and we're going to talk about the series. We're going to talk about what happened last week. We're going to talk about the off-season moves, the NLDS from last year, but we have to start with the troll job that the Padres did on Clayton Kershaw. And yes, it was a very uncharacteristic outing for Clayton Kershaw. He ends up issuing five walks. He's only done that 13 times in his career. Hadn't happened since 2019. Fernando Tatis Jr., he has cursed his number. He's gone seven for 23, yep. often with four bombs. And of course, you know, it was a little bit of a troll job. You guys, your social media team, wherever you did that, posted a video of Kershaw. And that video actually was after the NLDS, right? When they're in the dugout, he kind of yep. makes that face. But you had the crying emoji on. Just kind of what was your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, my followers, my fan subscribers, they know I didn't love it. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of Padre fans would say, listen, you know, more power to the Padres for doing that. It's funny. It's it's playing. But, you know, listen, I, I, I personally thought it was kind of a small, you know, city move by the San Diego Padres. This is a guy in Clayton Kershaw who's a top 10 pitcher of all time. He has two straight Cy Young Award year-esque numbers against the San Diego Padres. And with all due respect, I, listen, I love the Padres more than the Dodgers. We all know that. The Padres are my team. I'm from San Diego. But we don't warrant the right to do something like that when all we've done is won one playoff series against the Los Angeles Dodgers when they beat us in series all of last year. You know, we haven't won a World Series. I just thought we spoke too soon. Now, I'm all for Post and Clayton Kershaw crybaby on the scoreboard if we win a World Series that year and we beat them. But we didn't. And it was one game of the first series of the first time they met since the NLDS. It was just way too premature. And I'm a big superstitious. I'm a big karma guy when it comes to sports. DMAC. I, I'm a big fan of the baseball gods. And ever since the scoreboard at the time of recording this video, the Padres are one and four. Yeah, and right after the game of the post-game show, I was calling it the Clayton Kershaw, and I said, hey, this is going to fire up this team. They're going to probably take the next two because of it. Agreed. But look, I definitely, if you saw the post-game show, I was definitely triggered. I went off. I posted on Instagram, and I had about 500 Padres fans that were telling me that I was soft and that that I, you know, I was brave for posting a video of me crying online. Yeah. So you guys definitely let me have it. But the way I looked at it was this. Look, would the Dodgers ever do something like that to Tony Gwynn or Trevor Hoffman? The answer is probably no. But was I a little overreacting at on the moment I was? I mean, look, what is the most famous sports meme of all time, right? It's Michael Jordan and the crying meme. Okay, no one thinks any less of Michael Jordan for having that crying meme. My next question to you is, do you think the Dodgers will retaliate in any way? No, uh, we know who the Dodgers are. You guys are, a, you know, as, as much as I hate to say it, a, a sustained, consistent winner. There's a culture in Los Angeles. You know, I even tell some of my subscribers, the Dodgers have a clearly inferior roster to the San Diego Padres this year. doesn't mean they're going to end up with the worst record. They have a they have a better record than the San Diego Padres by a good margin right now. I think four games up. The Dodgers, you know, they are conditioned to just play baseball keep their heads down and play baseball and that's what i that's what i hope the potters can get to one day i would be shocked if your dodgers retaliate in any way maybe a retaliation at the very very end if they knock us out of the postseason yeah, they'll basically have to retaliate with their play because, look, the reality is, that as it stands right now, the Padres have one up on the Dodgers. Yes, the L.A. has won 10 of the 11 division championships in the last 11 years. Yes, the Padres haven't won one since 2006, but that Padres team in the NLDS, they got one on Big Brother. They, they did slay that dragon up the freeway, like Peter Seidler said. I mean, you're talking about a team that beat a Dodger team that had won 22 more games than them in the regular Crazy. season. Yeah. And I think there's a tons of pressure on this Dodger team sure. to try to one win this division again. And two, if they do face the Padres, you can't let that happen again. My next question to you is just how big was that series win as far as kind of getting that monkey off your back, getting that Dodgers monkey off your back and Ron, give you the confidence to say, Hey, we're not worried about the Dodgers. We're now focused on winning the world series. 
No, listen, I mean, I, I think there was there was two folds. Listen, I, I would be lying to you if I said this city wasn't at its highest cloud nine point, I feel like, in a very long time, beating the Los Angeles Dodgers, right? 111 wins. They won every series against us here. I think we won five games against the Dodgers at most last year, heading in to that 2022 postseason. But I also think on the other side of it, I think the celebration lasted too long. I thought we were content as an organization of beating the Dodgers. Maybe I shouldn't speak for the organization. As a fan base, we were content with how the season would end. At that point we didn't even really care for that philadelphia philly series now we can look back that on on hindsight and be like wow could have won a world series that year but i think beating the dodgers was more on Padres fans minds than hosting up that trophy excuse me at the end of the year so i think the players know though that it hasn't really carried into this year they have business to do the dodgers are another really really good ball club and i think it's going to be all-out war against these two teams for for years to come i know we have we can have that discussion but i i think it's important to separate players mindset versus fans mindset because i think they are two very different things if that makes sense yeah, no, I think it makes absolute sense. And I think you can't overstate the significance of that series win against the Dodgers. But I think you made a really good point in that I think Padres fans, it almost feels like they would root for the Dodgers to lose more than they would root for the Padres to win. I always say that you never heard a let's go Padres chant. It's always beat L.A. That's a good point. Beat L.A. That's yeah. just really me messing around. Look, the reality is this Padres organization, I think they are trailblazers. I think they've changed the game in Major League Baseball because they're not New York. They're not L.A. They're not Boston or Chicago. They're down there in San Diego, and they're spending like a big market. Now let's talk about this Padres roster and kind of what's been going right, what has been going right so far to start this year. Because one question I had about San Diego was, how will they deal with having these expectations? Because heading into last season, the Dodgers, they did what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to be a historically great team, and they really surpassed expectations. They were. 111 yeah. games in the regular season. They mm -hmm. only won one in the postseason, but still, Still, they got it done in the regular season. How do you think this Padres team has handled those expectations early on? Not great. And key words early on. I think there's been a lot of good things we've seen from the Padres but they have been able to put it together at the right time. For example, Xander Bogart started out the year scorching, hotter than fish grease because cooled off, and now when he's cooling off, Juan Soto is now starting to play some really, really good baseball, right? I think the pitching started off a little bit inconsistent to start the year, as well as the bullpen. Those two have rounded in the form, albeit over the last few days, it's been a little bit shaky. But the biggest problem with this Padre team, DMAC, we thought would be the pitching heading into this year. It's been the offense. It's been incredibly inconsistent, and it's pretty crazy to think. I mean, I'd say the Potters, pound for pound on paper, have the best lineup in the National League, if not the entire big leagues. When you're core four of Tati, Soto, Machado, Bogarts, it doesn't get better than that. You want to sprinkle another all-star, put in Jay Cronenworth hitting in the middle bottom of your order. The rich get richer. However, there hasn't been enough consistency. There hasn't been enough good approaches at the plate, but the biggest indicator of why this team has been able to win baseball games is because they are dead last in batting average with runners in scoring position. I know you've been you know, losing some hair lately with your daughters in running in scoring position, but the Padres have been even worse, dead last now, just surpassed the Detroit Tigers after their loss on May 11th today with runners in scoring position. So DMAC, you can have, you can have good pitching. You can have all-stars on your roster. But if you can't hit with runners in scoring position, you're going to lose a lot of baseball games. And that's been, so far, the telltale of the 2023 edition of the San Diego Padres. What about your Dodgers? What are your thoughts on them so far? 23-15, and 12-6 and 6 at home, strong start, already some separation in the NL West, long way to go, but early thoughts. Well, first of all, Borna, just don't bring up runners in scoring position in the Padres and the Dodgers. I get PTSD from that NLDS I'm where LA sure do. They stranded a small village. They left more traffic on the base pass in the 405 freeway at 5 p.m. <laughs> okay, in rush hour. I mean, what they did in that series and also in the last series, they go like three for 25. And they still are able to take two out of three from that Padres team. And yeah, you look at this Dodgers team. I mean, they got out really kind of hovering around 500. The pitching staff was struggling, save for Clay and Kershaw, Julio Urias didn't look great. Dustin May had some good starts, had some bad starts. Noah Syndergaard, he has really been a bust, if you want to be quite frank about it. We're calling him Noah Blistergaard at this point. He had to leave the start after just one inning. Tony Gonson looks, has looked pretty solid since he's returned. He had went six in his last appearance, but I think if you look at this Dodgers team as a whole, the offense, they're going to be just fine. I mean, I think this offense, believe it or not, I actually think they have the potential to be a better postseason offense than what we saw last season because we know Trey Elaborate Turner. Elaborate on that. You guys, what, do you, what do you mean by that exactly? What, what makes you say that? So the, what makes you say that is 
One, Will Smith. I mean, he, I think, can more than make up for what Trey Turner did on the right side of the plate. Because, look, this guy's not just emerging as the best hitting catcher in baseball. I think he's emerging as a legitimate bona fide MVP candidate. They're going to have to pay him Will very Smith, soon, huh? Did. You think they're going to pay him soon? So... I, in my personal opinion, you know, I've always, and that's one thing I really appreciate about the Padres, about the Braves, they give out more extensions than your local hair salon, right? You don't see that in <laughs> LA, okay? With Will Smith, Julio Urias, they just don't lock these guys up. And I think it's a myriad of different factors. And I think one of them is there's always depth at, in the farm system down in AAA. They know how to develop guys and kind of find that next guy and try to get the most out of their young talent. And when they're able to walk, they don't want to extend guys. They don't want to l- sign them unless you're a Mookie bet or Freddie Freeman, a true established superstar that I think brings other benefits outside of what you can do as just a player. I think Got one it. thing the Dodgers look for is their marketability. Can he sell jerseys? Does he put butts in the seats? Is he a big brand name like a Freddie Freeman, like a Mookie Betts? Whereas Will Smith, I mean, they have Diego Cartaya, who's an up-and-coming catcher, their top prospect. But I have been the conductor of the Let's Extend Will Smith train. That's not just because people on my show think I look like him and where there's a picture of us in the same room. So, hey, I can prove that we're not. But still, I definitely have been a big fan of that. I love what you guys did with Cronenworth. I love what you guys have done with some of your extensions. But, yeah, this team as a whole, I think if you had to kind of spot a pimple on I think weakness is the fact that one, you don't have a true shortstop. You really Mm -hmm. do not. And Miguel Rojas, since returning from that hamstring injury, from the groin injury, from the injuries that kind of plagued him early on, he has been better. He's hitting like 260. But I mean, you're talking about a team that had to play Mookie Betts, who hadn't played shortstop since he was in low A, right? had never started a game at the shortstop position. So, yeah, I think that's a big hole. Gavin Lux went out for this season. You didn't re-sign Trey Turner. And then, two, I think the bullpen as a whole is still trying to figure some things out. That's one thing that I really am envious of, of this Padres bullpen last year with Suarez, guys that can miss bats. I mean, what do you think is the state of the Padres bullpen right now? I know Suarez is on the 60-day elbow issues, but what is the state of that Padres bullpen? Well, you know, it, it's it's always tough to evaluate a bullpen, right? Because when your offense is struggling, it adds more magnification and pressure to your bullpen, right? So a lot of Pottery fans, whether they lost today to the Minnesota Twins, they want to they want to blame Brett Honeywell for allowing three runs in that seventh inning and blowing that game. But they're getting nothing from their offense. Listen, the Padres are missing Robert Suarez to an adjective that I can't even describe. I don't even have in my dictionary. They were probably four. Suarez gives them four extra wins this year. I can count on the top of my head. I mean, if we are assuming that he was Robert Suarez of last year, because some argue the fact that he was more dominant than Josh Hader in that bullpen for the San Diego Padres last year. I mean, was lights out in the eighth, gave you 99 mile per hour sinkers. That changeup was working for him. So, we don't have an update on Robert Suarez. He has an elbow tightness. We're, we're, we don't want to hear the, the 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 scary word of UCL. We're very worried about Robert Suarez. So I think they're missing him. I think their lack of depth without him has hurt him. They're also missing Adrian Morohone, who's a young, up-and-coming guy out of their bullpen. Potters gave him a lot of money coming out of Cuba in 2016. Really started to get going in the pen last year. Fastball's working. Curveball's working. So they've been relying on guys like Steven Wilson, who was driving Uber a year and a half ago to now be their eighth inning guy. They've been relying on guys like Brent Honeywell, who was once a top prospect, went under the knife twice to now deliver screwballs in big time situations right they've been relying on guys like Domingo Tapia that no one knew about so listen I think Preller has done well of finding guys and kind of picking guys and and contributing but at a certain point you need your firepower back and and it's going to be tougher and tougher as the days go on without a guy like Robert Suarez to find ways to win especially when your offense is adding more pressure to you because of their production or if I should say lack thereof so I I think the Padres had one of the better bullpens coming into the year, but injuries and bad fortune have not allowed them to show that. So are you confident that, one, you'll get guys back from injury? And I, like, I'm, I'm with you. You don't say UCL. You don't say TJ. I treat it like it's saying Voldemort and Harry Potter. You just don't say those words. But are you confident that they are going to get guys back? Or do you think that Preller is going to go out and explore the market and try to add some key additions to that pen, Borna? I, I Oh, I don't know if Suarez is going to play this year. And I know a lot of Potter fans are hearing July, late July, but is there one of these things that you keep, it keeps moving back. But, but, but here's what I, here's what I do want to say. If it is that scary Voldemort word, they should get it over with now and do it. The Potters made a big mistake with Denelson Lamette, not wanting to delay the inevitable. They, they, they knew it was the situation and they waited a year. He went under the knife. The rest is history. Another name DMAC the Potters are missing, Drew Pomerantz. It's a guy who was an all-star. I mean, five, six years ago as a starter, has not pitched for the Potters in two years, would be another other high leverage guy in their bullpen he had a rehab start about two weeks ago in El Paso and Fort Wayne said he kind of felt something a little bit again 
and the rest is history. At that point, for somebody who's been out for two plus years, it's not really here. It's up here. And you really hope that someone like Drew Pomerantz can find, you know, get through those mental demons and come back because the Padres need his support. They need these guys in the pen. But regardless if they're back or not, you already know Prowler's going to be active at the deadline. But I did tell Padre fans, no more excuses. You can't be looking externally. They have all the pieces inside. It's got to come from within, and only time will tell. Yeah, no, and that's one thing that I was talking about my conversation with Buster Olney, and you know that the lifeblood of my channel is trade rumors, right? I feed off them. They're like oxygen to me, and he told me that, hey, the Padres and the Dodgers, what you see is pretty much what you're going to get this season, because there's not going to be exactly. a lot of quality out there, and yeah, if you look at the Padres pen, if you look at the Dodgers pen, I think the big issue with the Dodgers is yeah, along like you talk about Pomerantz and some of these other guys, look, uh, Blake Trina was the same way. I mean, he's another guy that he didn't go and take care of his shoulder and he didn't undergo surgery when they recommended it and basically it set him back so look it's a bullpen we know that unless you have those established guys that you can trust each and every year they're volatile and you just never know what you're going to get but uh, look, yeah. Daniel Hudson is kind of the big key for the Dodgers because he was fantastic last season before he went down with that ACL injury he had a strikeout rate over 30% walking in around 5% of his batters he was really on his way to having a career year well he's gone off to a slow start as far as his recovery is done with some ankle issues some tendonitis and some arthritis and we'll see if he can come back and really establish himself as that Dodgers closer but yeah the bullpen is always an issue but one thing in particular I want to ask you a couple questions about the Padres offense and really of course I want to start with Juan Soto because I think it's a little overblown if you look at some of his advanced numbers some of uh -huh. his predictive stats he's still hitting the ball hard he's still walking at an elite level in the 100th percentile right and if you look at his numbers with the Padres and 812 over OPS since the trade with the Nationals, a 966 OPS. Now, the trade was insane. I mean, to me, if you can get Juan Soto, you get Juan Soto. I know you traded SeaWorld, you traded Legoland, Blink-182, <laughs> Tony Hawk, the Channel 4 News team. And the Chargers. Back, that's a no-brainer trade. <laughs> and my question to you is, why do you think he hasn't had the same success with the Padres that he had with the Nationals? Well, I do want to preface this by saying that Juan Soto has been maybe the hottest hitter on the planet over the last 10 games. And let's so I just want to say that, and then we can get into the question, because for the most part he hasn't been but over his last 10 games he's hitting 400 he's got 13 walks at eight nine extra base hits um the 1200 ops that's more of the Juan Soto that we know of anyways why hasn't it come together for a full run here so far you know last year's a little bit tough to compare to this year I think last year you know it, it's a huge culture shock. I mean, you've been in an organization forever. You're, you're, you're now staying in a hotel for a week. You're trying to figure out where you're going to live. Your family's not there with you anymore. I think there's a lot of factors that head into it. And, and let's not forget, DMAC, that Soto wasn't having his best year with the Nationals too that season, right? He was hitting 240. You know, his OBP was still about 400, but he's always going to walk, even if he's not hitting well. This year, the start was pretty unexplainable. I think a lot of Potter fans didn't know it. All they could do was react and just be scared, saying, oh my goodness, what is going on? Where's the Juan Soto of old? I think as the games went on, he felt the pressure more and more to produce. What that led to was him trying to just hit the ball, hit it out the yard, pulling the ball, pulling the ball. And I think we saw this MLB Network video two or three weeks ago of Juan Soto really working on driving his hips, trying to hit the ball the other way. And ever since that, he's been really focused on trying to hit the ball the other way, doubling, you know, extra base hits. So... I'm confident that Juan Soto is going to turn it around. I believe he already is turning it around. I give Pottery fans perspective with this. Sander Bogarts was the best player in baseball, potentially offensively, in the month of April. Juan Soto was arguably one of the worst. Soto's hitting 256. Bogarts is hitting 266. This season is a marathon. It's not a sprint, and it takes time. And you're starting to see Juan get going. You're starting to see the extra base hits compile on. But listen, DMAC, I still don't know what the answer to is. You know, I do a show with Heath Bell, and he says there's some players who peak at 23, 24, and people figure them out, and they're not that. But I don't think that's who Juan Soto is. I don't think that's who he will be, and I think we're going to see the real Juan Soto very, very shortly. Yeah, no, if I'm a Padres fan, I don't lose a wink of sleep worrying about Juan Soto. And I like you mentioned that the pull rates. I mean, if you look at his numbers, the pull rate over 40% for his career, around 28%. So, yeah, I think there's something to that. Also, I don't think he's as comfortable with the clock. I think he's still adjusting to that. But still, he sees the ball as well as any player in the league. I think, like you mentioned, he has been on a tear of late. And I'm just not concerned. I think... The next question, though, is a $440 million extension possibility, kind of turning that down. I don't know. I mean, if you're Juan Soto, I think you might want to think long and hard about a possible extension. Do you think that is looming? Do you think that is something that is impacting his game at all? 
I think the Padres were a little bit apprehensive. Uh, oh, you're talking about you know Soto and his game. I don't know. I mean, it's 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 easy to say. You know, it, it's easy to say. Man, did I just reject my life savings for 30 generations straight maybe but i i wanted to bring up something else i think it's interesting to note that i think the potters were a little bit apprehensive in terms of discussing an extension with juan soto i think they they want to see it come together they want that 285 32 home runs 1000 ops 160 ops plus 500 obp year before we talk about 500 million reasons to smile for juan soto and i and listen you never know there could be a there could be a steve cohen with juan soto coming off a, a bad year is still giving them that bag and 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 if and if they do that you tip your cap and you say good luck um but i think right now pottery fans would be a little bit wary of uh you know offering that kind of extension for juan soto until we really see it you know come all together what do you think no i think you're absolutely on the money with that one i think you definitely want to see a guy that look his calling card he's not a shohei otani who is a cy young award-winning potential pitcher and mvp player he doesn't do so many things at a dynamic level he's not a guy that's going to be ripping things up on the base pass he's not a gold glove caliber mm. defender even though i like that deke last year in the nld so <laughs> he, he hangs his hat on his, his ability to be an elite hitter and until he mm-hmm. proves that he could be an elite hitter for an entire season you don't consider signing him to that deal but i still think if you're the padres Look, the incumbent team always has the advantage. And let's say they make a run at Shohei Otani or some of these other free agents. I'm fearing that maybe the Padres go after Julio Urias in the offseason as a possibility. And I think if you don't get one of those really? guys, you might consider really throwing the bag at, at Soda. But another question I want to ask you about the Padres offense is, look, we know – it is a terrifying quartet. The tip of the spear on the Padres, they are elite. Yes, Machado's gone off to a slow start, but he's going to come around. Tatis, he's been really fantastic since so he's good. returned. <laughs> he's a Fernando Tatis. I mean, he's lighting the world on fire. And look, that you can trust that. They are going to get production from the one through four. My question to you is, do you have enough confidence in their five through nine? I mean, that seems to be, if you want to point something out that could be a weakness, is the lack of production in the bottom of the lineup. Do you think that is something that's a concern? And who do you think is going to step up in those roles? It's frustrating. You, you, you're confident Jake Cronworth's going to come around. You know who he is. He's a 240 guy. He's going to hit 18 bombs, play plus plus defense. Let's take a really look at this six to nine. Um, the catching situation has been uh, abysmal for the San Diego Padres. AJ Preller gave up the house to trade for Austin Nola back in 2020, and that's been one of his biggest backfire trades. I think they're getting nothing from him. People want him to be DF8, even though he has three or more years of team control. They have this young guy named Luis Campisano, who's been on the shelf for the last two, three weeks because of the thumb. We're really bullish on Campy. We're hoping when he returns, he can give us you that production. And Haslan came at the bottom of the order. He is who he is. He's a guy who doesn't see righties well, and he's a guy who loves seeing lefties. He's going to hit 220, play good defense. Trent Grisham's kind of the wild card, and he's the guy who's frustrating to Padre fans. Some days he'll just crush baseballs, and this guy can still hit 25 bombs this year, but other days he looks just, you know, he's wearing his Manta mask right at the plate, uh, not doing anything, not seeing anything, you know, striking out all the time. So, you know, it's so inconsistent. And DMAC, we talked about it. What won the Padres this series against y'all was probably the bottom of their order. Um, they were getting unbelievable production from 789 at the time jerks and profile right Trent Grisham Austin Nola so you know D-Mac, I don't know I don't know but I don't think the answer is going to be at the trade deadline they already got guys like Carpenter and Cruz as well they did their pre-trade deadline in free agency so uh, time will tell man but I, I what I do want to do right now is I think let's let, let's spend the final few moments and let, let, let's break down this Padres Dodgers series coming up here all right we got Friday night lights Padres Dodgers round two Dodgers off obviously took two out of three to start i thought that series could have went any any way i mean padres are probably mad that they didn't take two out of three at minimum in that series but those are the results now friday night believe we got blake snell versus dustin may and i'm not gonna lie to you dustin may is the one dodger i wish was a san diego padre man man (laughs) <laughs> Dustin Mania, man. I always say his stuff moves more than a military it's family. It's crazy. His two seamers. It, it's filthy. I mean, he's like made for pitching ninja, right? And he had a really nice start in his first appearance against the Padres. No runs on three hits. Not a lot of hard mm-hmm. contact. Went six frames. Had six punches. One walk. But, hey, that game was tight. I mean, a 2-1 win for the Dodgers. And Blake Snell, he br- basically Blake blinked first in that game because he was <laughs> mowing down Dodgers like we saw in the 2020 World Series before Austin Barnes had the big clutch base hit. And then He's ahead of Will Smith, 0-1, and, and then Will Smith, he works it back and gets a two-out walk, and then after that, Chris Taylor, he gets the home run. So they were close to 
really having a nice performance by Snellzilla and him having a outing that says, hey, we're going to make a mark on this series and maybe try to sweep the Dodgers. And Snellzilla was on point, but it was a close game. I look for Dustin May continuing to build that confidence. I mean, he had that sinker slider combination working at this against this Padres team. But hey, this Padres offense with a red hot Fernando Tatis Jr. seeing a Dustin May for the second time, that does scare me a little and yeah, we'll see if this offense can get it done. Now, the Saturday matchup, I'm looking forward to too because you got Joe Musgrove and we know Joe Musgrove, he knows how to get under the skin of Dodgers fans. He of course was on the Trastros as we like to call him. We know that he said last season that Justin Turner wasn't a threat. Then after that, JT goes off for the rest of the way. And then you have Julio Urias who had two bad starts and it's followed it up with three really, really good starts. And I, that's to me the marquee matchup. What are your thoughts on that matchup? It's a great matchup. I know Padre fans, we, we don't like Julio Urias to see him. The only guy who likes him is Manny Machado because that guy sees Julio Urias better than I don't even know at this point. He just owns Julio Urias. But listen, Urias was fantastic <clears throat> in his last start against the San Diego Padres. And I'd argue, DMAC, that he should have allowed no runs. Those were errors. I mean, by the Dodge, Mookie Betts right on that fly ball. And Outman was about to make a good play. It was a tough play. But uh, yeah. The key to Julio Urias that I've learned as a Padre fan is you got to get to him early. You got to get to him specifically early. A lot of good pitchers obviously are a little bit shakier on. They settle in. I've noticed that particularly with Julio. So if I'm the Padres in that outing, I'm looking to attack. I'm looking to swing first, you know, first pitch at bat, swinging, 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 and trying to scrape a run or two. Because, for example, they did that on Sunday, and it was a key to success, and they were one out away from taking the series because of that game plan. So, But once he settled in, He's damn near unhittable. What about you? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point because Julio has dealt with some first inning woes in the past. He's kind of looked a little unfit to start the year. I mean, I remember I was covering the game in the press box. And I saw him going up and down the stairs like he was rocky. And then after that, he puts together two quality starts. So I think Julio Arias is a guy that he's ready for this Padres team. He loves going up against this Padres team. Manny Machado, like you said, he absolutely has his number. Manny career versus Julio, a 12-47 OPS, there four home runs in 25 at bat so yeah you gotta hopefully work around Manny Machado but yeah I mean it's at home Julio's really gotten things together Joe Musgrove's another guy though that has given the Dodgers problems in the past and we know that with this Dodgers lineup that can be streaky at times Musgrove's gonna have to go out there and give you a quality start but I'm very interested in the Sunday matchup the Tony Gonsolin versus Michael Waka Waka by the way shout out to that meme you made with the Shakira because it's always every time I read the name, you know, it's in my head. The waka waka, <laughs> hey, it's, really yeah, it's a good one, huh? That's a good one. That was fire. But yeah, this matchup, look, Tony Gonsolin, it's going to be his fourth appearance. The velo's up a little bit from his last start. He's a been good, if I'm not mistaken, right? right? He's been good. Gonsolin's been good. Been pretty, I mean, the XFIP is almost five, so some of the okay. predictive stats don't love him. Okay. The command hasn't been fantastic, but yeah, I mean, against this Padres team, he was really good against them in 2020, 2021. So yeah, Tony Gonsolin hopefully has a good start, but what have you seen from Michael Waka so far to start the year? So up and down. He's had some outings where you're like, wow, this is the guy they, they went and go ahead and sign. Now, I will preface this by saying Michael Waka was – a big beneficiary of Fenway Park's high walls. The green monster last year is expected ERA was a north of five and a half versus real ERA was, I think, 3.2. So one of the luckier players in baseball, AJ Prowler is not an idiot. He knew that even before he was going to sign someone like Michael Walk. I think he's given you some great outings. His last start, I believe, was six innings, one run baseball. And I think he's had some, you know, one or two really, really bad starts that have inflated his earned run average. I know he had a start against the Brewers, which he allowed five runs in the first inning, really, you know, inflated his ERA. So I think with Michael Walker, it's not going to overwhelm me with this vlog but he's going to give you a nice array of pitches the cutter the changeup the fastball the two-seamer you never know what Michael Waka you're going to get. If they're getting good Michael Waka, I think the Padres can win that baseball game. But again, I hate to beat a dead horse. It all goes back to those Padres bats. You know, not it all goes back to those Padres bats. Do they want to be the Padres bats that we know they can be? Or do they want to be the Padres bats that we know they also can be? <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I think the Padres, they get up for a series at Dodgers Stadium. You yeah. saw Machado hitting a bomb off Kershaw last year in the NLDS. You saw Fernando Tatis Jr. off Trevor Bauer with a one-eyed cover game. So definitely... They're going to bring it in that series at Dodger Stadium, the Saturday game, a Fox nationally televised game. I got my chips and guacamole ready for Michael Walk and Gonsolin on Sunday. But give me your bold. Who's going to be the player of this series if the Padres win, Borna? This ain't a bold take. It's Fernando Tatis Jr. This is the guy who is... Uh, 
hasn't missed a step since returning to baseball uh, you know 15 16 months ago this is the engine of the team he's the motor of the team he's the energy igniter of the team with fernando tatis jr so i think if they get a big time series from el nino i'm talking slug production um they're gonna be pretty happy with the results again i, I cannot discount this enough when potwitch fans were talking about soda and all this stuff i always told them you guys were you guys have to remember fernando tatis jr is the best player on this team when he's right and uh, i think it's pretty clear that he is the best player on this team when he's right even over a guy like juan soto what about you for the dodgers who is going to be the key i know that was a boring answer but it's the truth how i feel who do you think is going to be the key for your la dodgers to take at least two out of three from my pod race yeah, I think I'm going to kind of return with another kind of boring answer, one that's a little on the nose. I got to go with Mookie Betts. I think Marcus sure. Lynn Betts coming off that series again against the Padres. Hater hadn't given up a home run the entire year. Two outs, he hits that bomb late in the ninth inning to tie things up. We've seen Mookie have some big moments against his Padres team. I think Mookie's hitting the ball a lot harder lately. He always has a strong month of May. I almost wanted to say Will Smith because I think that's possible. Freddie Freeman he scares has me. Not in his last game, but why not go Mookie Betts? He has a nose for the big moment, especially if it's nationally televised. So I think he's going to step up. But let's get some predictions. How many? What's your serious prediction? Three Listen, games, I'll, how many of the Padres going to win or lose? Let me know. I, I, I say the Padres take two out of three, and here, here's why I genuinely feel that. Number one, um, it's May, but there's some urgency. If the Padres want to win this division this year, it's an important series. The Dodgers are already four games up. I think the Padres have to remember how fast the Dodgers escaped You know, with that division last year. You guys knew you were going to win that division in, heck, what? Early July, you knew you were probably going to win that division. So I think it's imperative that the Padres know that, listen, if we want to stick with we want to have a shot at winning the NL West. I know it's not the World Series. We got to take two out of three and at least be three back instead of six back heading into the you know the remainder of our schedule. I get it; it's early, but I'm circling this series, and this is you know a little sense of urgency for the Padres to to play some good baseball here. What about you? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think a team is going to win two games this series, but it's going to be the Dodgers. I think the Dodgers will take two out of three against the Padres. I don't think it's going to be sweep Diego or anything like that. I think you're right. It's so urgent. It's so vital for this Padres team to go up to L.A. and have a strong series because, look, uh, there's the postseason. There's the regular season. This game is somewhere in between whatever that means. I mean, when it comes to postseason intensity. So, yeah, the Padres come up and have a big series. It's going to loom large because, look, they don't play them again until August. So, yeah, I like the Dodgers taking two out of three the gonsolin start on a sunday there's something just weird about these sunday afternoon dodgers games at dodger stadium that can be a little sleepy at times i like julio urias on saturday dustin may is the one that i think he has the highest variance as far as look if he's sharp with his command same with and he's snell. Feeling like we saw same with snell right that that yeah. that, that hate to cut you off there i no, think no, that's no. I, I think that's the swing game i think we look at that friday game and i think who takes that one should be feeling pretty good about their shot to win the series yeah absolutely that's the swing game because one you guys just had a game today in minnesota so you're traveling back the dodgers they finished their series with the brewers yesterday so these teams traveling it's the first game they're trying to get that intensity level up and look these teams have acknowledged at this point it is a rivalry i don't care what anyone says i know you're a big lakers fan yeah. i always say the padres versus the dodgers to me it's what the phoenix suns and the lakers used to be the lakers versus the kings used to be it's not the celtics or anything like that but we know that yeah back then i would rather seen the Lakers versus Suns or Lakers versus Kings and the Lakers versus Celtics, right? Yeah. I mean, it was the matchup of the moment because of the players that were on those teams and the fact that they were competing for the same thing. And I think that's what you're going to see from these two teams. So yeah, I'll take Dodgers two out of three. You got Padres two out of three. But uh, yeah, any other bold predictions for this series? Who goes, no, deep? Man. Who goes deep in game one? Let's do that. Who, 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 who goes, goes deep in game one? Who goes deep in game one? Juan Soto's going deep in game one. He's seeing a righty in Dustin May. He's hotter. The hot, one of the hottest hitters on the planet. I can see Soto uh, going yard in game one. What about you? I don't think we go deep on Blake Snell, but give me give me Will Smith going deep in, in game one. I think Will Smith has had a lot of time off. He's looking locked in on the plate at three for four game, had a home run in his last game. I like Smitty in that series. So, yeah, I mean, it should be a good one. Padres, Dodgers, round two. You had fireworks in the first one. We'll see. And the other thing, too, is I'm very interested. The Friday night, after what happened with Kershaw, the fans are going to be extra lit at the ravine. So get ready for that. Oh, it's going to be a playoff atmosphere at the ravine. So we appreciate everyone watching, guys. Again, Dodgers Nation on YouTube, Hogwatch on YouTube. Cheers to a good series, DMAC. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, no, it sure is a good series, and we'll do this soon, man. Hey, it's always good to check in with you, especially the Padres, Dodgers. It's going to be lit for the foreseeable future. So we'll do this again, Borna. All right, everyone. We're signing out. Peace.